There are those who dream of a better world. Those who strive to climb higher, swim deeper, and venture further than the rest. We call them Da Vinci's. We marvel at their genius and are awed by their unbreakable spirit. Here they come. Stand back and watch as they inspire the human race by living a Da Vinci life. How's it going, guys? This is Rusty Johnson from Da Vinci Life. Thanks for stopping by. Now, today's guest, uh, James Arthur Ray, is controversial right now. Over the past few years. You probably first saw him on the hit movie The Secret, doing really well. He had a multi-million dollar business, a real self-help guru, really focusing on personal performance, and really was on top of the world. Then he had a retreat where at the end of the retreat, they were having a kind of graduation type event of a sweat lodge. And while leading this sweat lodge, three people died. He was arrested, charged with negligent homicide, and spent two years in prison. He now is out of prison and working to redeem himself, redeem his soul perhaps, and to get back on his feet. And now has changed a bit of a focus to be a redemption coach. And I'd like to see what you think about it. Is he an angel of enlightenment or a guru of ill repute? You be the judge. James. Rusty, how are you, man? Good, buddy. How's it going? Forgive me for being a couple minutes late. It's one of those days I got back-to-back -back meetings. I'm, I'm doing great. Quite all right. No problem at all. Yeah, in L.A.? Or? No, no, no. We're in uh, Henderson, Nevada. Oh, nice. Yeah, nice. We, we were in L.A. until, well, it's been almost four years now. It'll be four years mm -hmm. in August. We, we left L.A. and moved out to Henderson. Nice. How are you yeah. dealing with COVID and all that crap out there? Um, you know, that we have a, a governor who still got everything locked down. Well, it's yeah. not as locked down, but we still have to wear masks and, and there's some restrictions. Supposedly that's gonna, that's gonna blow over, they say in June, but they still say we have to wear masks. So I don't mm -hmm. know. Where are you Rusty? In New York. Yeah. You, you're really jacked up. <laughs> yeah. yeah sorry for laughing sorry for laughing but it, oh, no, okay, it's, man. It, it's the truth luckily uh, i'm an hour and a half north of new york city i'm between the hudson river and the catskill mountains so i can get out and get out in the woods and walk around i'm not stuck in the city but still you know in your home if you're lucky you get your mask on you go to the grocery store get what you need and then come back home and not much you know happening after that i you know i love the travel you know, i guide in the amazon and, and work with shamans in the amazon for 15 years and so it used to be every other month every few months i'm down there doing that and right and and this year has just been it's so terrible sitting here twiddling my thumbs up at home so they won't let let you leave from new york or you can't go into peru or brazil yeah, it's both. Peru. It's yeah. it's Peru, and it's and it's kind of both. Uh, you know, here if I wanted to push it, I could get down there, but they they're real strict down there. Yeah, they're, they're stricter than up in New York. They really want to nip this in the bud. And, oh, really? And they're in still, Peru? yeah, and they're still having issues. But and the medical system down there is just choked out. Yeah, they, it's they don't have one to begin with, and and then you're getting tragedies of like if. If you have appendicitis and Corona, they won't operate on you. And I, I personally know two people have died from appendicitis uh, because wow. they had Corona. And uh, so, you know, they can't keep up with it either. So, but hopefully now, now the vaccines are passing around and, and uh, hopefully we'll get back to some re restoration. if not close to. Yeah, say our prayers. Yeah. But uh, oh, thanks for coming on the show. You know, I, I first caught up with you when I saw The Secret, which uh, wow, what a, what an incredible documentary, man! It really it seems like it's a lifetime ago. Oh, I can imagine, man. I yeah. can imagine that was so long ago. But it's uh, I tell you, it changed a lot of lives, and and even just that separate mindset of using the law of attraction. I've seen it 
work in my life and and uh, and so many more. So it's been fantastic. But uh, you know, your story, of course, without saying, has been you know truly captivating. My first question is really on how did you get your start? You know, like as you as a young person, what were your your goals and and also before your success, what was your motivation? Well. When I was really young, I'll, I'll do my best to condense, condense this because I, I grew up in the household of a Protestant minister in mm-hmm. the buckle of the Bible Belt, Tulsa, Oklahoma, right down the street from Oral Roberts University. My dad was very dynamic, very charismatic, and quite overbearing. I was an introverted, uh, insecure young kid. I was scrawny. And I was bullied in school. And so I started when I was 18 to study, you know, obviously I was schooled in the Christian tradition. I have the utmost respect for all traditions. I think all of them have a seed of truth. And so I was schooled very heavily in the Christian tradition and I wasn't getting all the answers that to the questions I was asking. And so I thought I was going to go off on a quest of my own. And when I was 18, I picked up, the Buddhist Bible, uh, which is kind of weird in Tulsa, Oklahoma, down the street from (laughs) Old Roberts University, but, but that's kind of the person that I was. And so I started, you know, that really started me on a path to find my own answers for how this universe worked. And, and I thought if I could find my, my original motivation to your question was if I can figure out how this universe works, then I can feel better because I don't feel very good and, and I'm bullied and, and, and I'm insecure and, and all of these things. And so it took me off on an, on an incredible journey that has lasted to this day. And I, mm-hmm. I, it, it's, I'm really kind of a, an enigma in a sense, because I was schooled in biz. Well, my, my traditional schooling was in behavioral sciences and, and that's, what I really, really enjoy is what drives us to do and not do. And mm-hmm. then I got it, but I got into business at at and and I was in sales and I did really well. And I got put into management and I eventually ended up at at and School of Business as a C-suite consultant working with executives on things like leadership, team performance, culture change initiatives, communication, all of those types of things. And yet still at night, I was studying all these different comparative religions and these mystical traditions. And and so again, it's been very eclectic and I'm somewhat of an enigma because uh, I, I really, really enjoy, you mentioned that, you know, Peru and that you study shamanism Mm -hmm. and, and I, um, you know, I've, I've, I've studied with the shamans in the Andes. I I had one of my, I've had six major mentors in my life. And one of them was a shaman from the, the Toltec Andean tradition. He was his teacher, Don Manuel was kind of like the Dalai Lama of the Andes Mm -hmm. and, and the direct descendants of the Inca, the Quiero Indians were the direct descendants of the Inca. And I've Mm -hmm. I've spent a lot of time over there. I've spent a lot of time crawling through temples and tombs in Egypt and has some incredible stories. I've I've scaled Mount Mount Sinai and spent the night in Moses's cave, supposedly where he got the Ten Commandments. And yet at the same time, I was building an Inc. 500 company (laughs) <laughs> and a $10 million business. So right. what I've always had this fascination with is how to take the power of spirit, if you will, and I don't mean religion, mm-hmm. you know, if you're religious, I highly respect that. And for me, spirit is that is that life force. It's that energy that comes through all of us. How, how do I learn to access that and bring it into a practical application and build a business or do whatever it is that my purpose drives me to do. And that's, that's been my quest my entire life, Rusty. And it's, it's been a, an incredible journey to say the least. My wife and I talk frequently and say, man, we're never going to get to the end of it all and look back and go, damn, that was boring. You know, it's, it's, it just, it, it's been a heck of a ride. Mm -hmm. Now for your first step, when you wanted to take the motivational route, uh, you, you, 
you've had you know interviews with Oprah and and just the, the list goes on and on. But what, what was that first step that kind of put you on the map? To break into the public, yeah. uh, you mean in a big way? <clears throat> uh, probably see the secret. You know, I mm -hmm. I started my business in '92. And I, I struggled like every entrepreneur does. I struggled for mm -hmm. years and years and years. I, I There were so many years that I was on vision sandwiches and faith cookies, you know, just, <laughs> just, just trying to figure out which credit card had a balance on it and, and, and almost going down for the third count or a third time. And then something would come through. And it was really, it was a rough ride. In 2006, actually, no, it was 2005. I was asked to participate in this movie called The Secret. I and and you know I met the producer and she she shared her vision. We didn't get paid a nickel to do that, by the way. None of us. Mm. It, it was a labor of love, even mm. though it made hundred tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars later. Um, mm. That all the people who are in it did it out of the as a labor of love, as a give back, and right. and so I participated in that. And didn't think a whole lot more about it for a while and was almost ready to throw in the towel. And then it hit big in 2006 and just catapulted me into a whole new arena. And like you mentioned, Oprah and Larry King, and I was on the day show once mm -hmm. a month for many months running and, and my business just <clears throat> exploded in a good way and grew. And, and so that was the real impetus for mm -hmm. me rising to the peak, if you will. And then of course, mm -hmm. if you know my story, I've also been to the pit and, yes. and everything, everything in between. Gift hidden in it. It's just in work clothes sometimes. It, but yeah. if you'll dig. Oprah you really, really connected dig, with you. Was it the first time you were on was with a, a group of people? Or whatever. Right? Did she have you almost like the next day, have you on by yourself or how did that? A uh, couple, couple weeks later. Yeah, mm -hmm. she had me and, and Michael Beckwith on and, mm -hmm. and picked us out of the group and, and invited us to come back and, and be on her show a couple weeks later. And, and also she, she offered me to have a show on her, to have my own spot on her show. Mm -hmm. And, and we talked about that in a conference room for many hours, Oprah and her lawyer and myself. And, and it just wasn't, it wasn't a good business move at the time because of all the restrictions of the contract. And I wanted to do it. And yeah. yet the the contract was so restrictive that I I actually turned Oprah down, which very few people do. And, and yeah, it wasn't really. because I didn't want to work with her. I just I'm a businessman and I I ran the numbers and I looked at the restrictions and I said, I just I can't do this because I would have to basically shelve my entire business. At that time, I had a 10 million dollar business and I had you know, a team of 36 people who, who were on payroll and they were counting on me to make smart decisions. And, and it just, it wasn't me that I only had to think of at that point. Mm -hmm. When we go to 2009, at, at 2009, you were on the top of the world, right? You're, you had a book, uh, Harmonic Wealth, and not only was it a, a bestseller, but it was People Magazine going to one of the best reads and uh it was just everything was growing but then suddenly in a flash it, as you mentioned the pit it all came crumbling down so what happened well what specifically happened was a horrible accident and unfortunately you know i write about this in my new book the business of redemption i tell the whole story and unfortunately we we'll never ever know for sure because there was a lot of assumptions made right away. The detective didn't follow up on the forensics. They didn't take blood tests. You know, at the end of the day, for your viewer who doesn't know the story, we had a sweat lodge at the end of a five day deep dive retreat and three people lost their lives. And, and it broke my heart because that whole week, Rusty was, about and maybe you understand this term given that you've you've done some shamanic work but it's about soul retrieval it's about you know we have this pain and a part of who we are gets stuck in this past issue because when it happens to us 
we don't have the resources necessary to deal with it. And so what we tend to do is compartmentalize it and, mm -hmm. and move on. And in the, in the moment, that's, that's helpful. But in the long haul, it's very hurtful because that never goes away. And a part of you literally gets stuck there. And so without going into a lot of detail, that whole week was about a deep dive into, into the participants' unresolved emotional issues. And, and taking them back and, and healing those and, and integrating those so that we can bring wholeness back into ourselves for our day-to-day -day operations. It's, it's very powerful. And so I got to know, it was a very small event for me then, it hit 52 people. I, you know, at that point in time, I had anywhere from a minimum of 500 all the way up to, to 2,500 people in a room when I was presenting. And, and so it was 52 people, very up close and personal. I got to know them. And if you've ever lost someone that you love and care about, then it's heartbreaking, man. And, and, and what made it worse is it happened on my watch. You know, it was, it was my event. It was my choice to do a dangerous exercise. And three people lost their lives in that sweat lodge. And, and that, that's really unfortunate because that was just like a graduation event. Mm -hmm. The entire event was them doing the deep work psychologically, emotionally. And this mm -hmm. sweat lodge was kind of like just a, a physical metaphor to say, Hey, I've done all this psychological, emotional work. Now I'm going to go into a difficult setting and I'm going to, to commit to myself and my own unconscious and the, and the universe at large that I'm going to transfer this and, and take it back through the tough times at home in my life mm -hmm. and business. So yeah, they, they lost their lives and, and the state of Arizona came after me for manslaughter, which, mm -hmm. You know, I, I want to go on record and say I accept full responsibility. In fact, the first chapter of my whole of my book, The Business of Redemption, is titled I Am Responsible. And mm -hmm. I accept full responsibility. It was my lodge, it was my team, it was my event, it was my choice to do what we now know today be a dangerous exercise. And that's the price of leadership. Yeah. You know, when you when you go sideways in your business or something goes sideways, there's only one person in the crosshairs. And that's mm -hmm. that's the leader. And you don't throw your team under the bus. You don't you don't place blame. You don't point fingers. You shoulder it. And if you can't mm -hmm. do that, you can't step up to that kind of responsibility. Then you need to stand down because that's the price of leadership. And so it. It was a, it's a heavy burden to bear, Rusty, and I, I think okay, about right. it, you know, all the time, and I will for the rest of my days. Yeah, because even uh, in my experience of uh, given ayahuasca ceremonies, uh, and cambo, as well as viper venom ceremonies, you know, knock on wood, everything's gone far and well so far. But there's times when, when you're you know, given therapy to to say someone going through a, a bad ayahuasca experience. And when I say bad, it's typically good because they're always good. They're it's always good. Them. It's just uncomfortable, right? Yeah. And yeah. but there was moments I, I sat there and, and it was you know helping them. And then just in a fleeting moment, I just thought, like, what if they just died? And, you know, and I would get this feeling in my stomach, like, oh my God, what the heck? and and almost to the point I, I wouldn't want to do it anymore until later I saw. The benefit that they got from it which would push me forward but so i can't imagine in your experience on, on how you felt when when you went through that and i know you got criticized of leaving afterwards and the police trying to find you but what during that time what was going through your mind when this reality hit well you? well again in my book the business of redemption i kind of set the record straight because mm -hmm. as as you might be aware the media is not sworn to tell the truth absolutely that's why they, i want to talk to you yeah they're they're you know they have they have no obligation to journalism unfortunately they have obligation to sensationalism and mm -hmm. and they and they don't they don't always tell the truth and and so if ever <laughs> quite frankly the the fact is i was there till 2 a.m in the morning they said i left the scene that's not true i was mm -hmm. in the back of a police car until 2 a.m in the morning 
because they were trying to decide if they were going to to put me in jail or not. I was on the phone with my lawyer and mm -hmm. during that entire time. And by the time I got out at, at 2 a.m. in the morning, everyone had disbanded. Everyone was either asleep, some people had left. And mm -hmm. my lawyer, you know, as it went down, because the very first thing out of, out of the detective's mouth when he approached me was, we're investigating this as a homicide. Now, try that one on for size, Rusty. I mean, yeah. that, that's like, are that's you kidding words, me? Man. I, I mean, my head started spinning. What? You know, are you are you serious? Are you kidding me? And so so I immediately called my lawyer and I've been I was on the phone back and forth with my lawyer until 2 a.m. And I was locked in the back of a police car. So so then <laughs> then the media comes out and says I fled the scene. Well, no, I oh. when I got out at 2 a.m., everyone was disbanded or asleep. And my lawyer said to me, look. I said, I want to go to the hospital and see, you know, some of these other people and what's going on with them. He said, no, you can't because the reporters will be all over you and, and the, the families don't want to see you anyway. And, and so you need to meet with me first thing in the morning because you're in, in big trouble. And I didn't quite comprehend at that time how ominous this really was because in my mind, as heartbreaking as it was, it was obviously an accident. And by the way, the jury finally ruled it as an accident. They couldn't find one shred of evidence. They tried. Not guilty. Mm -hmm. The state of Arizona tried, but they couldn't find one shred of evidence to corroborate that anything wasn't done. It was done intentionally. There was no, I, I mean, Rusty, what kind of a businessman, entrepreneur is going to harm his clients and think he's going to stay in business intentionally, yeah. harm his clients? And it's just, it's ludicrous. And, and so, yeah, that, I mean, that's the reality. And, mm -hmm. and when I got out at 2 a.m., he said, get out of there and get a fly because we, I got to meet with you. I've never even met this guy. I, who has a, a criminal lawyer? Yeah, you don't, need right? <laughs> I, yeah, who needs one? I didn't need one. And so I got introduced to this guy from my civil lawyer who drew contracts up for me. I'd never met him. And he said, we got to meet tomorrow because this is a big deal. And by that time it was all over the media. And, mm -hmm. and so it wasn't going away. Yeah. Now, how long was the trial till your sentencing? Uh, three, months. three months. Oh, between uh, before, how long was the trial it was three months. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, of that entire three months, two days was my defense. So mm -hmm. all the rest of that was, was the state, you know, bringing all this stuff to bear to tell the world what a horrible person I was. And, and the fact mm -hmm. is, you know, Rusty, if I, if the only thing I knew about me was what I saw in the media, I wouldn't like me very much either. Mm -hmm. And, and unfortunately, that's what a lot of people see, and that's what a lot of people hear, and they take it at face value. But three months of trial, and they wanted 30 years. Wow. 30 years. So, so if you can imagine the stress of sitting in trial five days a week for, for three months, every single day of the week, with 30 years hanging in front of your, in, over your head, it was... It was really, it was tough. It was very, very difficult. And, you know, next to that was I ended up going to prison, as you know. Mm -hmm. I, I got I got acquitted of homicide of, of of homicide, obviously. And what I got was negligence. And yep. and so above I own that, you know, because negligence says some bad mistakes were made. There were things overlooked. Yes, I wish they hadn't have been. There was things that could have been done better. I, I, I fully agree with that. And I wish they would have done, been done better. You know, I, I didn't know that people were in trouble and I wish I would have because I would have stopped it immediately had I known. Mm -hmm. and, and so I ended up going from, from, you know, a three months trial that was incredibly stressful, fighting 30 years to going right into prison and, and I got, you know, two years. And so mm -hmm. I went into prison for two years and got out in 2013. Mm -hmm. How'd you make the best of prison? 
you know, it's, it's, um, it was not easy. Mm-hmm. You know, I, it took me a while. I was really, really angry and bitter. I spent the first 30 days in solitary confinement right next to death row uh, at, at the walls in, in, in what's called the hole. And mm-hmm. it was one of the most difficult times of my entire life. It was also one of the most beautiful times of my entire life because I started go back to, to when I was 18 and I picked up the Buddha's Bible. I started meditating when I was 18 and I've had a practice that's almost daily ever since then. And some more lengthy than others. And yet, and, and, and so the point is I'd been on, and I was on the road over 250 days a year by myself and I was single. And so I was really, really comfortable with me, with, with me as my best friend and me as my favorite company. And so, you know, solitary confinement wasn't that bad for me for that reason, because it, it felt safe for me because I, when I went into prison, Rusty, I didn't know if I was going to get sta- stabbed or raped or beat up or killed. I didn't know. I didn't know anything about prison except what I'd seen on HBO. And that wasn't very pretty. <laughs> That's not pretty. Yeah. No, not at all. <laughs> and so, so I was really frightened. And so mm-hmm. to be locked down behind steel doors in solitary confinement was comforting to me because it was just me and God and mm-hmm. four walls and no one else was going to get to me through that door. And that, mm-hmm. that initially it didn't last because I ended up going to minimum security eventually, mm-hmm. but initially that felt really secure and it allowed me to do a lot of introspection and, and long answer to your question, get work through the anger and the bitterness. And I, and I talk again in my, in my latest book about this conversation that I had with God or my higher self or, or spirit, whatever you want to call it, it doesn't matter. When I was sitting in solitary, that was life-changing for me. And it it really turned a light on for me. And so many things from that moment forward did as well. I learned so much, Rusty. I grew so much. I'm so much more aware. I'm a much better human being. Mm -hmm coming through that i don't want to do it again (laughs) no way (laughs) and and yet yet i also am grateful for it and i see the 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 perfection in it all if you if you will and please you know for the viewer i'm not saying it was perfect that three people lost their lives I, i can't even i can't speak for them or their families and my heart goes out to them and 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 i can't even imagine how they felt or or anyone that was negatively impacted i can only speak for me and and the bottom line is we all have challenging times our world is full of challenging times right now we're in turbulent times in our Mm -hmm. world and we were talking a little bit about that before we started and and so what better way for me to be equipped to help people through turbulent times than to have gone through some of the most horrendous and turbulent times myself it's not just theory it's it's yeah. real life experience yeah but i do have a question i think you've already answered it is that did that prison time make you a better motivational speaker than if well i at first of all i i don't i don't consider myself a motivational speaker you know and mm-hmm. and and that's i know a lot of people call me that because they don't know what else to call me i right. i really believe that I I am, you know, a consultant and I'm an advisor, a leadership and performance advisor. And I and I do some speaking, not nearly mm-hmm. as much since 2020. You know, it's it's all like right. this now pretty much and it's on Zoom. Yeah. But it, it makes me a better human being. It makes me a better husband. It it, it makes me more compassionate. It makes me understand. I'll give you an example. I remember Back when I was living in Beverly Hills on Mulholland Drive, and I was making, I was pocketing four million a year personally. My company was doing ten million, and you know I had I had over a million people from 147 countries around the world have come to ask me how to improve their life, how to improve their relationships, how to improve their business, and and there's some hubris that comes along with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, at some point in time, I was like, man, I've done all this work and I've had all these tough times and all these challenges so that I can be here now. 
and I've kind of gone through the tough stuff. Well, little did I know, but, but the reality is when the housing market tanked back in 2006, I think it was, if you'll remember, a lot of people were in trouble because the banks had, had overloaned and, and yes. given these crazy loans that they didn't verify. A lot of people were in trouble and people were standing up in my audience and going, James, they're foreclosing on my home. What do I do? And I, it breaks my heart now to think about it because my intention's always been good. My approach and methodology could have improved in many cases. And I, I would, my answer would be, James, what am I going to do? And I'd be, look, you know, the bank doesn't want your home. They have enough homes that what they want is a commitment and a plan. So you get really committed and you come up with a plan and you contact your bank and you you convey your commitment and you tell them your plan and they'll work with you and you'll and you'll save your home if that's what you want to do. I really believed that until mm. 2009 and 2010 <laughs> when when the housing market tanked again and I was on the tail end of this horrible accident and I was trying to save I had seven foreclosures in 2010, Rusty. And, oh. and, and yeah, and <laughs> I was trying, I was on the phone with my commitment and my plan and the banks were basically telling me to pound sand because at that time, our then president Obama had, had given all the money, all this stimulus to the banks and not have, there was no rules or guidelines as to how they were to use it. And they weren't using it. They were pocket, they were putting it away. Yeah. And they, <laughs> the bonuses, and they didn't have to work with me because they had these bonuses and screw you. You know, I, I took a really good shot short sale on my on two office spaces that I had to my bank at the time. And they said, No, no, we're just going to come after you with a lawsuit. I said, this is a good offer. In this time, this is a really good offer. It wasn't even that short. And they go, No, no, we don't want it. We're going to come after you. And I said, I said, I don't have anything to come after. Because I was man, I was busted. And, and this was after all the the whole empire came crumbling down. And, and you know what the banker said to me? He said, well, then I guess you won't have anything to worry about when we come after you, will, will you? Mm. And this was the same guy who literally, Rusty, was sitting in my office six months earlier telling me he'd bend over backwards to have more business with me. And, and so, so now I look at that and I go back in my mind to my audience member who stood up and was really, really you know, distraught and wanting help. And I, I had a good heart, but man, <laughs> I didn't know because I was so far removed mm -hmm. from that pain and that challenge and that suffering that I couldn't have compassion. Here's, you know, what we tend to forget, Rusty, is that the word passion is a Latin for suffering. Mm -hmm. It means suffering in Latin. And so compassion C-O-M, the prefix of compassion is similar to common. It's the same prefix. So compassion is common suffering. You can't have compassion unless you've had similar suffering. You can't. You can have, you can have empathy, you know, which is trying to feel what they feel, but you can't have real compassion. And I see so many examples of that in my own life where my intention was good, but I didn't have the compassion because man, I'm on the top of the mountain and I'm going, Hey, come on up here. The, the vision is beautiful and the air is pristine. And they're going, I can't James. I can't. Oh yes, you can. Come on, just come on up. I'll show you how. And, and so, yeah, it's changed me immensely rusty in, in yeah. many, many ways. The day that you walked out of prison, what was your mission? Did you have one solid that this is what I'm going to do, or you kind of were no, I, feeling I, it out? I'll tell you, when I came out of prison in 2013, I was I was mentally and emotionally chaotic. I I my whole life had been shattered. I was I had lost 40 pounds, Rusty, that I didn't need to lose. Mm -hmm. I had periodontal disease, horrific periodontal disease. I, I was alone. I was homeless, literally. Wow. And I was $20 million in debt. That was 2013. What's that? Eight years ago now. Mm -hmm. And 
20 million dollars in debt standing in the middle of the arizona desert homeless 20 million in debt in horrible physical condition and i was just i i knew i had to to get my head on you know the reason that i i named my latest book the business of redemption is because when you understand I'm a student of language. The, the word redemption properly defined is to gain or regain something by paying the price. I was in severe need of redemption. I, had, I knew I had to, to regain and I knew it was going to be a tremendous price to pay. And yet I didn't know where to get started. I didn't want to come back into leadership and performance. I really didn't. In fact, I had a, when, when I was at the top, William Morris was my my agency and they were shopping TV shows for me and all these types of things. And I and my my agent stayed with me through the whole storm. Incredible guy. He passed a couple of years ago and I miss him to this day. And and yet I told him, I said, I said, I don't want to do what I do anymore. I said, you know, the guy that that MCs Dancing for the Stars, you know, that guy, I don't know his name. I said, you know, that guy. And he, he represented him and he goes, yeah, I know him. And I said, I want that job. I said, give me that job. I'll MC some game show and I'll go home and I'll sleep in my own bed at night. And I won't have to worry with all with all the praise and the blame and all the things that come with fame. Mm -hmm. And and he goes, you can do that. And I go, I know I can do it. So let's do that. Well, that didn't last very long you know, because that's not why I'm here. Yeah. And, and so little by little, Rusty, as I started to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, I started to realize that I had so much to share and so much more to give than I ever had before, given what I've been through. There's nobody in leadership and performance that I know of, and there may not be anybody who's been through what I've been through. There's nobody who does what I do, who can, who can help people through turbulence and has had the experience, not theory, not something you read in a book, but, but real life experience. And so I, I felt like I had an obligation to put that into practice. And little by little, I started to put myself back together and I realized that's my purpose and that's what I've got mm -hmm. to do. As you're progressing forward and, and obviously going through this, I'm sure it was a classic case of knowing who your real friends are. What was the situation of the people you thought were close to you ran for the hills after this happened or some people that you didn't even realize would stick with you did or, or how was that dynamic? <laughs> well, every single person that I knew in the industry either evaporated or stabbed me in the back, went into the media and stabbed me in the back, mm -hmm. with the exception of two people. And that, that was Rhonda Byrne and Bob Proctor. Those two people stayed the course with me, and I'm forever indebted to them. And then I, I studied with a Zen master for years and years, and he stood with me. Uh, Roshi stood with me through all that storm, too. But everyone else, and I knew everybody, Rusty. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody wanted to do business with me. Everybody wanted to joint venture with me. Everybody wanted to, to do this, that, and the other. And boy, I was so popular, and I was, I was everyone's greatest friend until the crap hit the fan. And, and they disappeared like mist in the noonday sun, just gone. Yeah. And I, it really hurt Rusty. And I remember my Zen master, I was, I was really broken. And I was saying to him, man, I just can't believe that no one, no text, no phone call, no email, no, Hey, hang in there. We're praying for you. No, Hey, how are you doing? None of, none of that. And, and so I said, I just don't get it. And he said, you know, James, we all hope that our friends will be there for us when things go sideways. Mm -hmm. They won't. Now that's harsh medicine. <laughs> but what I realize now, Rusty, is it's not because they're bad people. I believe everyone is inherently good. Some of us choose bad behaviors, but everyone is inherently good. God or spirit doesn't create any crap. We, we do that to ourselves, if that makes yeah. sense to you. We create, the, we create the nonsense ourselves. God doesn't create that. And, and so, 
So everyone's inherently good. It's not that they're bad people. It's just that everyone is, is scrambling so hard to deal with their own stuff that they don't have the bandwidth to deal with your stuff. Yeah. They're not bad people. They just don't have the bandwidth and the time. And, and so when you go back to 2009, 10, and look at what was going on in the world, the housing market was crashing, the economy was in trouble, the market was off, people who were doing events were, were sucking wind, kind of like 2020. Yeah. And, and so I understand it. It doesn't mean it didn't hurt. It doesn't mean it wasn't uncomfortable. And we all we all want to think, Rusty. Excuse me one second. Go ahead. All of us would like to think that we take the high road. Yeah. And yet, here's what I now know. You can't really be sure you'll take the high road until you're in the midst of the storm. Mm -hmm. because we'd all like to think, I'd like to think, man, I'd be there for you, Rusty. If, if things went sideways, I'd be there. I'd have you back. I'd be reaching out. I'd be supporting you. And, and I'd like to think I would. And yet until we hit the storm, we don't really know because mm -hmm. sometimes you just don't have the bandwidth. You just mm -hmm. don't. And so again, that's compassion and that's understanding that, that I've had to develop through a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. Have you gotten any pushback from that industry just because of the past or have they been welcoming? No, there's mm -hmm. no, there's been no welcoming. Uh, to this day, not one has reached out to me and yeah. said, and they know, they know I'm back. I, I've been back yeah. at it since 2013 mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I don't expect, I don't expect them to. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. What I do know is that prior to 2020, a lot of, a lot of venues and events booked me to come do a presentation. And then several months later, the producer would call me and say, Hey, we're getting a lot of flack from this group and they're going to boycott the event. And I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to fill the seats. And so I'm going to have to take you off the ticket. Mm -hmm. And that that's really unfortunate. And you got, you know, you have Google to thank for that, because mm -hmm. if, if you we 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 have attempted to clean up Google, we I put out so much content since 2013. You know that some marketing people will tell you put out a lot of content and you'll and you'll change Google. Well, no, that's not true. And, and so mm -hmm. so Google doesn't do me any favors because the things that still have the highest traffic are some of the, the very damning and, and attacking types of, of um, pieces that were written on me. Yeah. And so, so it's been, a, it's been a, it's been a tough road, but you know what, Rusty, when you know what your purpose is, you don't quit. Yeah. You just don't. And that's, that's a big part of the work that I do is to helping you and everyone I'm blessed to serve to really get clarity on what their purpose is, because that's what brings meaning to life. When, when mm -hmm. you, when you know why you're here and we're all here right now in this turbulent time for a specific reason, there's no accidents. We're here for a specific reason in this turbulent time, this transitional time, this disruptive time in our world. And you have, you have a piece to play, a part to play, Rusty, that I don't have. And I have a part to play that you don't have. And if we don't fulfill our part, then there's a void in the universal plan. And, and yeah. so that's your purpose. And that brings meaning into life. Mm -hmm. And when your life is full of meaning, then you live fulfilled. And that doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean you're happy all the time. You know, mm -hmm. only the only person that's happy all the time is a droid. You know, there's mm -hmm. human beings have this whole emotional up and down and back and forth. And that's part of being a human being. And, mm -hmm. and so when when you get locked into that, though, you just you don't quit. You just keep going. Yeah. Do you feel that a lot of the good work that you've done in the past has been erased because of this? Well, what hasn't been erased, has it, has it been overlooked or forgotten? Yeah that, yeah, that was my point. Yeah, probably. 
It, it probably has, but that's okay because I'm a different person now anyway, and the message is very different now than it was before. I mean, there's certain pieces that that are still here because they're fundamental truths, and yet, yet, um, yeah. I mean, has it has it been tainted or overlooked? Absolutely. Uh, again, especially for for a new market, if they Google James Arthur Ray, they're going to see, and, and dependent upon the person, some people are going to go, oh, well, that makes him better. Other people are going to go, oh, you know, he's a cult leader. And I, I've been called everything. And, right. and, and another How, one. How does it feel the, to be called a cult leader? Um, it used to hurt. Now it just, it rolls off like duck yeah. off of duck's back. It really, you know, that's one of the gifts, Rusty, is that when you've been called a murderer and a cult leader and, and, you know, a charlatan and all, I've been called everything in the book, you know, words and labels don't phase me much anymore because I, I had, it did initially. I mean, I was curled up in the fetal position for a long time. And I literally, I'm not kidding you. I didn't, I didn't think I could handle it. I didn't think I could take it. There was many, many days where I just pray. I happen to believe in reincarnation. I can't prove it, but I believe in it. And I, I would pray to God, just recycle me, you know, just, just take me because I can't handle this. And, right. and so I'm glad God didn't listen because I'm, I'm here or, and I wouldn't have been if God would have listened. And, and yet, it, it was very difficult to be called all those things because, but the lesson is that I went from, from this media star and this savior, if you will, to, to the extreme opposite, to be attacked and crucified and, and called, you know, a devil and all kinds of other crazy terms. I, I learned neither one of them matter. You know, I mean, neither one of them matter. They're just, they're just someone's perception. And at the end of the day, Rusty, you have to know who you are, regardless mm -hmm. of whether you get a lot of likes and shares on Facebook or, or any yeah. other social media, or no matter what mm -hmm. the trolls say, you have to know who you are. And, and when you can get through that, then you just, you just continue and you say, mm -hmm. God bless you. You, you're entitled to your perception and God bless you. I wish you all the best. I'm, I'm continuing on. Right. Now, through the years, you've helped a lot of people rebuild their lives. How much more difficult was it for you to eventually rebuild your own? Well, I'm still rebuilding. You know, it's, it's, it's been very difficult. Like I said, I was $20 million in debt in 2013 and I was homeless. And you can tell mm -hmm. now I'm, I'm not homeless. My, my wife and I, and I wasn't even, I wasn't married then. I didn't even know my wife then. And now I'm married to the most amazing woman in the world. And some, some husbands would argue against that and, and you should. Uh, and yet that's what I'm I know too. To I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm right. Mentioned. I got the most wonderful wife in the world for me. You know, it's there you go. Fantastic there you found go. That. And, and that's how it should be. And, and that's how you should feel. And so it's been tough, man. I mean, there's been so many, um, juggling this and juggling that and, and trying to get cards and, and, and looking at, at interest rates and going to the pawn store. And I mean, it's been tough because I was before the whole meltdown, supposedly I was worth over $20 million. Mm -hmm. And here's another great lesson too. It was gone like that. Mm -hmm. It's gone like that. So was I really worth that much? You know, because if it can be gone like that, it wasn't real. Yeah. And most of it was tied up in assets. And and most of those assets had liabilities attached to them. And so it's really, it's been so enlightening to get back to the heart. Mm -hmm. And nothing gets you back there better than suffering. You know, there's yeah. some salvation and suffering. And that's not popular either. But suffering pulls away the layers of BS and gets you back to the heart, to the core of what's really, really important. Mm -hmm. And and it's totally different for me now. I'm grateful for all that. I'm grateful to have experienced it. And I don't have any need for it at this mm -hmm. particular point in my life. You know, I just want to do what I love to do. And my wife and I have, have a, a modest home here in Henderson, Nevada. 
and we do what we love and, and we have a great life together and we work together and and you know i i couldn't ask for anything anything more at this point what has influenced you most about hitting rock bottom that's a really good question no one's ever asked me that i think i think that what influenced me most is an understanding that i had studied in the eastern traditions for a long long time but hadn't had any experience of that everything in the physical world is transitory it it all is transitory and we don't like that you know the third dimensional ego doesn't like that because we want to be we want to be certain and we want to have a strong foundation and we want to think things are permanent but nothing is permanent in this world in this in this third dimensional reality nothing's permanent the only thing that's permanent is who you are. And so when I was standing in the desert, homeless, alone, and worse than broke, broke was $20 million over my head just to be broke, <laughs> right? I mean, broke looked good from where yeah. I was. Then the only thing I had left was, <clears throat> was who I am, Rusty. And, and here's what I know is that your true wealth is not what you have. Your true wealth is what you're left with when all you have is gone. And that's why so many people have spun out in 2020, because they spent their entire lives focused on a job or a title or a position or a salary or a savings. And then it was gone like that in that amount of time. I mean, wasn't it crazy in the first of 2020, how the entire world went into lockdown, not just one country, but the entire world. And there was no force. There was just fear. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, because of fear, we all went into this voluntary lockdown because there was no militia either. And so, so it, it's really amazing to look at how quickly things can change. And I know a lot of people who own businesses that are never coming back. Yeah. They're, they're, they're never coming back. I mean, some of our favorite uh, restaurants went down and they're never coming back. And that's really sad. Yeah. And so when you can understand that all things are transitory, then you enjoy them. And yet you stay non-attached. You don't get yeah. attached to them. And that's easier said than done. It, it's way easier said than done. Sure. How has the uh, documentary Enlighten Us helped you? I don't know if it's helped me or not um you know there's mixed reviews on it and and everybody views through their own perception so yeah. <clears throat> some people who think that i'm i'm an an asshole watch the documentary and they go see i knew it mm -hmm. and other people who are more neutral they make a decision other people who are more supportive they go man my heart goes out to them and and so i don't mm -hmm. know that it's helped me I really don't know, Rusty. What I do know is that I didn't do it for that. My motivation for doing that documentary was they approached me when I was in prison and pitched me on the idea. And my entire drive to do that was to be as transparent as possible and to let people see behind the curtain because most people in the personal performance industry will never let you see behind the curtain. They're always the hero. They're always perfect. They're always in a peak state. They're always happy. They're always, you know, oh, I'm like this all the time. Well, no, no, you're not. Cause I know you, you're not like that all the time. And if you were, I'd want to strangle you because no, you drive me nuts. And so, yeah. and so I mean, no, no, nobody want to live with you if you were like that all the time. And, and so, so I wanted to be as honest and transparent as possible. I think I achieved that. I, I wanted to also be as upfront about the challenges I was going through. So hopefully the viewer would look at, at my life and go, man, if he made it through that and he's still here, then I can make it through this, whatever this mm -hmm. is for the viewer. And, and, there's a lot of things I, I'd love to see differently about the documentary. It didn't turn out exactly as it was pitched to me. And yet 
it is what it is. And, and I have a mm. lot of people on both sides of the coin. Some of them who still go, I watch this and you're a jerk and other people come and go, man, you inspire me. And I think, you know, you, you, you encourage me to continue. Mm -hmm. So that, that was my objective. Now, when, when you take such a, a big hit to success as you did, what are some of the uh, psychological repercussions from that? Well, I, I had, you know, I had to realign and reconstruct my world model. My, my entire world model was shattered. And, and I'll tell you, I was living in a large sense in illusion because I kept thinking from the outset that, well, eventually, you know, the media and the public are going to wake up and they're going to see my work and my work's going to speak for itself. And they're going to know I've invested my entire life trying to help people. And I'm a great citizen. I've never had any kind of legal problems ever. I've never been in trouble with the law. And, and they're going to they're going to notice all that. And they're going to say, OK, this was a horrible accident, which it was. I really believe that. And my lawyers did, too, by the way. My lawyers kept saying, hey, this is a civil issue at best. You're probably going to get sued. You have to pay money on a civil <clears throat> settlement. And, and I was OK with that. But it's not a, it's not a criminal issue. There, mm -hmm. there have been multiple deaths in sweat lodges previously. And that's documented. None of them had ever been prosecuted as a crime. And and so this is going to go away and it's going to be a civil mm -hmm. issue. So obviously that didn't happen. And so I, I had to totally reconstruct my world model and I got a, a real education on how the world works and how our legal system works and how our government works and, mm -hmm. and, and politics and, and all of those kinds of things. So that's, hopefully that answers your question. There's, there's so mm -hmm. many tangents and I know we're tight on time here. There's so many mm -hmm. tangents I could go off on, on what specifically I had to reconstruct, but I will just right. say it was my entire world model on how things work and don't work. What's your plans for the future as well as the plans to, to help reconstruct credibility as well as move on to what you want to do? Well, I'm doing what I want to do. My plans for the future are to continue doing doing what I'm doing. You know, my my wife and I, 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 you know, built my entire career in business. As I as I mentioned, I was a C-suite consultant at AT and T School of Business, and so I got away from that when I got into writing books and public seminars and all of that. And we've gone back to that, and we're we're really good. I'll humbly say we're really good at helping businesses change their culture and, and change mm -hmm. their behavior and change their results and, and the people that comprise that. And so we're working with, a, a, we have a big business contract we're working with right now. We still do live events. We just did one last weekend called Personal Purpose and Power, a three-day mm -hmm. event. And they're all on Zoom now. So oh, that's kind of cool too, because you know, we're homebodies. I've always been kind of an introvert, as I mentioned to you, and, and my mm -hmm. wife and I are homebodies. And we we have a, 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 a studio here where we do our, our video events and such. And and so we don't have to leave. We, we sleep in our own bed at night and, mm -hmm. and you don't have to get on a plane. And, and it's really accessible for people because they don't have to leave their living room or their office either. It's not the same. I mean, you miss human interaction, you miss hugs and you miss, mm -hmm. you know, eye to eye. And yet it's, it's, it's the next best thing. Mm -hmm. And we're having a, a really good time. We have a, a, I do coaching, a limited amount of coaching one-on-one -on -one because it's very time consuming the way I do it. And then we have a, a new group that we started last year called Project Stay Home, which is on Zoom and a whole group of, of individuals from all over the globe who are growth minded and committed, get together every Thursday night and get live coaching with me and Bersaba, my wife. So we're, we're really doing what we want to do. And, and I, you know, am, am I worth the millions that I once was? Well, 
you know, spiritually, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, physically, tangibly, no. And and that's okay. It's okay. Yeah. You know, it's that's not what it's about anymore for me. Um, nor was it ever. And so I, I just feel I'm, I'm in a really good place right now, Rusty. I feel really, really blessed and really grateful okay. to be able to do what I know I'm here to do. Who or what motivates you right now? Well, what motivates me is my purpose is, mm -hmm. is, you know, I, I really want to impact, influence, guide and direct the the consciousness and the awareness of every person that I'm blessed to serve. And mm -hmm. even if that's in a small way, and that, that motivates me, it really inspires me because when we hear, Hey, I've, I've lost 10 pounds or when we hear, Hey, I met my dream mate, or when we hear, Hey, I've grown my business nine times over since working with you, whatever it is, that's, it's very rewarding. There's two mm -hmm. kinds of income. There's psychic income and there's monetary income and psychic is the best. Psychic is the income that you get from taking your kids to piano recital and, and, and ballet and sporting events. You don't get paid any monetary income, but you get a lot of psychic income for that. And, and mm -hmm. that's, that's the thing that really moves the spirit and soul. And, and that's how it is for me too. Well, James, thanks so much for talking with me. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for your time. Keep on keeping on. I will keep doing great work, Rusty. And, and thank you for the opportunity to, to speak with you and your viewers. Uh, God bless you and, and uh, have a masterful day. We'll talk soon. You too. Thanks so much, James. Bye-bye. A Da Vinci Life.